Once upon a time, in the scenic wilderness of New Hampshire, there was a community. Now this community was not unlike many others. They gossiped until the wee hours of the morning, played soccer until the sunset, lived in log cabins at the foot of a sloping hill, ate their meals in a large historic barn. If you were to take a walk through this seemingly inconspicuous community, however, you might notice something not altogether commonplace. The cabins and the barn, though made of strong New England wood, leaked. They leaked music. The sounds of an overeager vocalist practicing her daily warm-ups. The laborious slow practice of a violinist learning a Brahms piano trio. The light-hearted scalar passages of a Mozart string quartet. This place I described is the Apple Hill Center for Chamber Music in Nelson, New Hampshire. Every year, musicians from all over the world gather for 10 days to create and share chamber music. I was lucky enough to attend Apple Hill's Summer Chamber Music Festival for two years in high school, and I will be returning this upcoming summer. Okay. One of my favorite, there we go, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, one of my favorite experiences at Apple Hill occurred when I performed Mio's Piano Trio. And it did not matter that the violinist was from Ireland, the clarinetist from Singapore, the coach from, the, from Israel, or I, the pianist, from the United States. In fact, this diversity fueled our excitement to perform, and to this day, this has remained one of my favorite musical experiences. There are a few places like Apple Hill, a place where religion and politics are set aside for Beethoven and Bach. In fact, Apple Hill's mission, their initiative is playing for peace. The in-residence string quartet travels to conflicted areas around the globe, such as Cyprus and Greece, Israel and Arab nations, to not only perform, but to engage the community in making music, connecting people who would otherwise not be brought together. Places like Apple Hill have convinced me that music is a universal language, a language that can be spoken and appreciated by people without regard for religion, race, ethnicity, college education, or even musical education. In fact, you don't need a formal musical education in order to appreciate the powerful language of music. You're all better musicians than you think. We have certain schemas instilled in us, schemas that even children with autism can grasp. We often associate minor modes and slower tempos with feelings of sadness, and major modes and faster tempos with feelings of happiness, and we don't even need lyrics to understand these dichotomies. Now, music as a universal language is an idea many of you have probably heard before. But when I use this phrase, I don't mean to imply that we are going to understand the nuances and the intimacies of every culture's music. I want to emphasize the word universal, which may be defined as, quote, belonging or relating to the whole. Music belongs to the whole of humankind. It transcends boundaries to unite. It is deemed one of the best forms of emotional communication, and it is a drive behind social and political change. Music moves us in more ways than one. To begin to understand how this ineffable power of music came about, we must take a few steps back and look at the co-occurring evolution of music and the human species. <laughs> music has been present since the days humans had a pharynx, a larynx, and vocal cords. Music evolved with humans. Daniel Levitin, a neuroscientist at McGill University, outlines in his book, The World in Six Songs, how our Neanderthal ancestors used music for survival. Music was for organizing and energizing. If we could synchronize our sounds and our movements to create a massive echoing noise, our enemies would retreat from attack in fear. Music made us formidable. This marriage of music and movement was vital for obtaining food, for protecting the enemy, and for communicating socially and emotionally in our ever-struggling nomadic community. If we wanted to attract a mate, music proved a handy tool. Females were drawn to the men in the group who could sing the loudest, defend the enemy most successfully, soothe them with their romantic songs at the end of the night. 
Evolution can explain such things as why girls today are attracted to men with guitars. <laughs> music in this way is thought to have preceded the construction of language. Music, with its organized structure and synchronized beats, could travel long distances in ways that speech could not. In much the same manner that the question, what came, is a source of unanswered contention, the more scholarly question of what came first, music or language, has plagued neuroscientists and philosophers for centuries. But though I could stand here and elucidate all of the theories on the evolution of music and language, and while I find them incredibly fascinating, that doesn't very much answer the question of why music matters to us today. We know what was important for the survival of our ancestors, but in a time when surprise enemy attacks are no longer a prevalent threat, what implications does music have today? Why has music survived evolution? Why is music present in every culture around the world, from the throat singing of the Tuvan population in Mongolia to the Tagore folk songs of India? Why are humans obsessed with music? On a microcosmic level, I listened to the song Man in the Mirror for the entire two hours I was at the gym yesterday, uh, working off my nerves of this speech. On a macrocosmic level, music infiltrates every aspect of society. It's in the dentist's office, clothing stores. It's on the phone when we are put on hold. Music is so ingrained in our everyday lives to the point where it would be impossible to imagine a world without it. To begin to understand this obsession, we must turn to neuroscience. Playing music and even just simply listening to music activates more parts of the brain than almost any other activity. The prefrontal cortex or the executive functioning region of the brain that is activated when we subconsciously predict what will come next in a melody. Uh, this region even shows increased activation when our innate musical expectations are defied and we hear, say, a diminished chord at the end of the phrase instead of the tonic. Music also activates the nucleus accumbens, part of our brain's reward center that releases the feel-good neurotransmitter dopamine. The same neurotransmitter that is involved in other pleasurable activities such as having sex or eating chocolate. Musicians who perform in groups like rock bands or choruses exhibit sustained release of both dopamine and endorphins. This phenomenon is often referred to as a musician's high and is something I myself have experienced when performing in chamber music groups. Um, so music activates all of these regions of the brain and many, many more that I don't have time to go into. Um, but music also makes us healthier by increasing immunoglobulin A levels and decreasing levels of the stress hormone cortisol. So music makes us happy and it makes us healthy. It's ubiquitous because it makes us feel good. Whether I was aware of it or not, man in the mirror was probably leading to sustained dopamine release and was motivating me to work out at the gym. Now I'd like you all to humor me for a minute. Close your eyes. Think of your favorite song or piece of music right at this moment. When was the last time you heard it? Why do you like it? How does it make you feel? Okay, you can open. Now I can guarantee that each and every person in this room thought of a different song, but no doubt many of the feelings that these songs aroused were similar whether it was happiness, sadness, frustration, excitement. Everyone's taste in music is different, but no matter what music we like, the same brain regions are activated. <laughs> My, even Obama likes music. Um, My grandma's Frank Sinatra is my teenage cousin's Eminem. Music is personalized. It defines us. But despite this, music is still universal. It reaches people from all walks of life without regard for our specific personal preferences. 
the poignant and profound ways that music can extend its reach is probably best explained through the lens of patients suffering from neurological diseases and disorders. Aphasia is a loss of language resulting from brain damage due to a stroke or traumatic brain injury. Many patients with aphasia can still carry a tune even when they cannot formulate a response to a question as simple as, how are you? I'm investigating this phenomenon at the lab I work at here at BU, the Aphasia Research Lab, and it's mind-blowing to see essentially nonverbal patients hum the tune to Happy Birthday or Oh Susanna. There's evidence of patients with Alzheimer's disease who cannot remember the names of their children or what year it is, but can still sing songs from their childhood. Patients with Parkinson's disease, whose hallmark symptom is trouble initiating movements, showed improvement in this debilitating symptom when administered sessions of music therapy as opposed to the more traditional physical therapy. Now, each of these neurological diseases and disorders is marked by very different brain damage. Aphasia results from damage to Broca's area in the frontal lobe or Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe. Alzheimer's results from the accumulation of plaques and tangles throughout the entirety of the brain. And Parkinson's results from the loss of dopaminergic neurons in the basal ganglia. So how can sufferers of such a diverse range of diseases have a positive if not almost magical response to music. And I believe that there is one brain region in particular that can help explain this puzzle, and that is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is one of the evolutionary oldest parts of the brain, often referred to as the reptilian brain. It processes rhythm and meter in music, what Levitin refers to as, quote, foot tapping music. But the cerebellum has also been shown to contain receptors for the pleasurable neurotransmitter dopamine, and it is implicated in emotional processing. I am of the mindset that we can partially attribute our processing of music to the cerebellum, a region that largely remains intact when others may not. The cerebellum can also explain the inexplicable link between music and dance, the synchronization between song and movement. Why, in some languages, Music and dance are one word. It is inconceivable that one can exist without the other. Why some Parkinson's patients can dance to music but not walk. Why weddings and clubs are filled with music. Why we experience an innate urge to move when we hear music. And even if we don't get up and move, there's a little part inside of us that does. Last year, I had the wonderful opportunity to attend a music therapy session at Boston Children's Hospital. I joined with one of the therapists there for a session in the neurological ward. We walked, trailing a cart of tambourines, rain sticks, and bongo drums into the room of a seven-year-old boy. I picked up one of the bongo drums and started keeping the beat to a song that the therapist was singing and playing on her guitar. The boy started to open his eyes sit up in bed. He even cracked a faint smile. So we gave him a rain stick and he immediately started playing the rain stick to the main beats of the song that we were playing. The boy's parents said that they had not seen their son this happy or engaged in weeks. At that moment, I knew I wanted to devote my career to music and neuroscience, to helping people like this young boy and validating music therapy as a powerful clinical and medical tool. So I hope at this point I've been able to convince all of you of how powerful music can be in a scientific context. But music is also a tool, a tool that our evolutionary ancestors tapped into and a tool that we still use today. When Martin Luther King led his march from Selma, he and his thousands of followers sang, we shall overcome as they marched, a song still sung in schools across the nation. When John Kerry flew to Paris after the recent terrorist attacks, he did not just stand and recite a speech before the thousands of mourners, but rather brought James Taylor with him to sing, You've Got a Friend. 
and the Nile Project, who was just in residency here at BU. The Nile Project brings together 14 musicians from 10 different countries around the Nile Basin with the goals of creating unity over issues surrounding the Nile Basin's resources and creating awareness of ecological issues. And I had the wonderful opportunity to meet the members of the Nile Project when they came and performed in Sci Auditorium and they came to visit one of my classes. Um, this is me pictured with Kasiva Mutua, who is the only female professional percussionist in Kenya. Um, and while they were here, I had the opportunity to interview the president and CEO of the Nile Project, Mina Gerges. And I told him I was giving this talk, and I asked him in one to two sentences, if you could tell me something about the Nile Project and change. The Nile Project and society, what would it be? Anything you want me to say. And this is what he came up with. He said, quote, the Nile Project represents the kinds of relationships we'd like to see in the Nile Basin in music. It's a metaphor for how we'd like the Nile citizens to organize. The music is a spark for social change. Once you open that door, you see things in a different way. My concluding challenge to you is to sign up for cello lessons within the next 24 hours. <laughs> Looking at you. No, I'm just kidding. My concluding challenge is a little bit simpler than that. It's to listen. Not just to listen, but really listen. Listen to what music can do for our well-being. Engage in its potential. Use it to connect and share with others. Use it as a spark for change. No matter where we come from or what music we like, music moves us. It moves us to be healthy and happy, to cry, to laugh, and to dance. So just listen. Thank you.